So my name is Vikas Sohal. I'm a psychiatrist and neuroscientist here at UCSF. And I'm going to tell you about a project that was a collaboration between my laboratory and that of Eddie Chang, who, as many of you know, is a neurosurgeon here at UCSF. And we were interested in how emotion and mood are represented in the human brain, right? As psychiatrists, as physicians, as scientists, we know that these things must be somewhere in the brain. Uh, it should, in principle, be possible to measure brain activity at a point in time and infer whether someone was feeling happy or sad. But if you were to ask me or, or pretty much anyone else, like what exactly would these patterns look like, uh, we wouldn't know. And we wouldn't even know if the same patterns would be relevant to, to you and to me. So we don't really know enough to be able to study or target the specific brain circuits that give rise to mood and emotion in the brain. Now, you can imagine a, a relatively straightforward scientific approach to solving these problems, right? You'd want to get snapshots of brain activity at, at different points in time, and then figure out which of those snapshots corresponded to periods when someone was feeling happy or when they were feeling sad, and then try to associate particular patterns of brain activity with times of, of happiness or, or periods of sadness, right? And although this sounds straightforward, there are important reasons why no one has been able to do this kind of thing until now. The first is, of course, that brain activity is just incredibly complex, right? There are more possible configurations of brain activity than there are electrons in the universe, right? Um, so even if we can measure that brain activity, we might not know how to make sense of it in the right ways. Uh, the second kind of related issue is that, you know, because there's so many different possible patterns of brain activity, some of them might line up with periods of feeling happy or sad just by chance, right? And so it, it might be hard uh, to know that you had really found the right thing. So how did we uh, overcome these challenges? Well, we took advantage of a really unique data set that had been collected by the Chang Lab. And they used cutting edge technologies to make really high density electrical recordings from multiple regions in the brain at once. And they did this in individuals who were in the hospital because they had medically intractable seizures, right? And so they had electrodes in their brain to try to figure out where those seizures were coming from. And while they were in the hospital having their brain activity recorded, we asked them to periodically say whether they were feeling happy or sad or, or anxious or, or something else. Now, for the reasons I already touched on, we didn't jump straight to looking at brain activity when they were happy and comparing that to brain activity when they were sad. Instead, we kind of took a step back and took a big data approach and just asked, well, what kinds of patterns of brain activity tend to recur? What, what happens over time in a given individual? What we found were networks, groups of brain regions that tend to turn on or turn off in sync. And moreover, we found the same networks in different people. Now, we decided to focus our analysis on these networks because, first of all, there's relatively few of these networks compared to the space of all possible patterns of brain activity. And secondly, the fact that we found the same networks over and over again in different people made us think that these were really biologically important entities uh, that were worth focusing on. So we asked, are there particular networks which predict when a given person is going to feel happy or sad? And what we found is that in about two-thirds of our subjects, there was just one network that consistently predicted when they were going to feel more sad or anxious. Now, this network was dominated by communication between two brain regions, the amygdala and the hippocampus, at a particular frequency that we could measure. And this is interesting because the amygdala has long been associated with emotion, and the hippocampus has long been associated with memory. So our results suggest that when these two brain regions are talking to each other at a particular frequency that we can measure, that corresponds to periods when people are, are ruminating and feeling anxious and, and starting to feel more down. So what can we do with this information? As a psychiatrist, when a patient walks into my office and they say, you know, I've, I've been feeling down for the past couple of weeks, uh, I'm anxious, or something that happened to me a few years ago that I just can't stop thinking about, uh, and it, it's really getting me down, I, I could say to them, you know, that, that's not in your imagination. Uh, there's actually specific parts of your brain and there's specific electrical signals that we can measure in those parts of your brain that are driving that experience you're having. And that can be incredibly validating. Uh, at the same time, there's now a clinical trial that's being planned 
here at UCSF to look at how specific treatments, including brain stimulation, might be able to you know, abort periods when uh, activity in this network is, is becoming too high and entering a kind of dangerous and, and pathological level likely to lead to severe depression. Uh, and as a psychiatrist and, and scientist, I can go and look for the cells in the brain that are actually generating these signals to try to understand more about the biology of mood and emotion. So I, I'm really excited about this uh, finding. I'm even more excited about all the things that it makes possible, and, and these are all things that are going to be happening in the next few years here at UCSF.